slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Anybody in here glad about that? For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. And then the psalmist writes these words, As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. The temple was built on an east to west line so that a sacrifice made at the altar would be made in the east and and, uh, the high priest was, as he went about his duties, he would go from east to west, never north to south always east to west. That was the line of the tabernacle and later the temple permanently in Jerusalem. And there's a reason for that because, uh, you see, the earth has poles, a north pole and a south pole. Everything that is north dead ends at the north pole. And everything that is south dead ends at the south pole. But when you look east to west, there's no such dead end. East to west is a continuous line. And so the psalmist catches that through the spirit of prophecy that as far as the east is from the west, in other words, an innumerable, uncountable, immeasurable distance, that's how far God has removed our transgressions from us. You say, well, that psalmist in the Old Testament, he wouldn't have known about the north and south pole, and you're right, but God knew about the north and south pole. And so when God inspired those words, the psalmist caught it. Now, here in the West, our minds always think in terms of definition. We always like little pat formulas, and we like mathematics, and we like calculating it all out. But the Eastern mind, the Eastern lands in which the Bible was written, uh, the Eastern mind thinks in terms of stories and images and metaphors. And that's why uh, when God wants to explain something, often it will come in a story, like the prodigal son. That story has so much power. There's not a measurement in it. You can't measure the father's love. You can't measure the son's rebellion. Uh, You can't measure the depth of his sin. And you can't measure the height of his restoration. But the story says it all. And so in explaining his mercy and in explaining his love and explaining his forgiveness, oftentimes in the word of God, the Lord will give us a story. He'll give us a very powerful picture. In your Bible, in Leviticus 16, Leviticus is one of those books that we don't read a whole lot because it's so full of Old Testament ceremonies and sacrifices and all of that. and We don't read that a whole lot. But there are beautiful pictures in that book. In Leviticus 16, it describes the great day of atonement, the high holy day in the nation of Israel when sins were forgiven under the old covenant. It happened on the 10th day of the first month. New Year's Day in Israel was called the Feast of Trumpets and that began 10 days of fasting and soul searching on the part of every single Jewish person. For 10 days... Every person in Israel would get real and get right before God. They would ask themselves questions. Where have I sinned? And where have I let God down? Where have I broken His laws? Where have I failed? It was a solemn time for ten solid days. They even called it the days of awe. They were in awe of the holiness of God. And it was a frightening time. When you finally got to the end of that those days of fasting, and you got to the great day of atonement, on this one day there were several ceremonies, but two in particular stand out very strongly, strikingly in fact. The first you know a lot about. It was that first ceremony where the high priest of Israel would go behind the veil of the tabernacle, later the temple, and he would go into the Holy of Holies, and there he would sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice on the mercy seat. The atmosphere in Israel, thousands of people on the temple mount waiting for the priest to come out of the temple. Thousands of them. And and the atmosphere would be tense because if his offering was not accepted, then the sins of the people, the entire nation, a whole year's worth of sins would not be forgiven. Period. End of story. And on this day, It was different than any other day in the calendar year. 
There were hundreds of priests, but on this day, the high priest alone officiated. He had been living in the temple now for this entire time, these days of fasting. And he had stayed up all night, the night before the great day of atonement, studying the law one more time, just to make sure that he didn't make any mistakes, because the entire nation's future rested on him. Throughout the day, he would wash his whole body five times. And as he went about the sacrifices, he would thoroughly wash his hands and his feet ten times. He started the day in his beautiful, stately, high priestly garments. But before the atonement ceremonies, he would change into a simple robe of plain white linen. Because that symbolized something. He was coming before God humbly as an ordinary man. Definitely as a nervous man. He was going to ask forgiveness. And in scripture, white is the color of forgiveness. Imagine the scene. Thousands, tens of thousands of people gathered around after ten days of fasting. They are waiting before God to have their sins forgiven. The destiny of an entire nation rests in the hands and the actions of one man who is going to go into the presence of God to make a sin offering on their behalf. They had better hope he doesn't make a mistake. And what a collective sigh of relief. I'm sure you could hear a murmur and a rumble on the temple mount when they finally saw the high priest exit from the temple realizing he'd come successfully from the Holy of Holies. It's powerful and beautiful. Only after that critical task was completed did the high priest move on to the second unique ceremony on the great day of atonement. It was another picture a ritual, and this one involved two goats, the Lord's goat and the scapegoat. And we find that again in Leviticus 16. Verse 7 says, And he shall take the two goats and present them before the door, at the, before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats. One lot will be for the Lord, it will be the Lord's goat, And the other lot will be for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell. And that goat will die. He will offer him for a sin offering. It is the Lord's goat. It belongs to the Lord as an offering for sin. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat, that goat lives. It shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and then to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. So this is the picture. The high priest will actually cast lots. He will uh, reach into an urn, a clay urn, and in that urn will be only two things, two stones. Some scholars say a black stone and a white stone. We're not totally sure of that, but we think that's the case. But we do know that on uh, the, the white stone will be written, For the Lord. It will be the Lord's goat. If that stone comes out first, because his right hand always goes in first, if the white stone which says on it, For the Lord, if that comes out first, then the goat on the right will die. The goat on the right will belong to the Lord. If He reaches into the urn and the black stone comes out first. The black stone says for Azazel. It says for the scapegoat. And if the black stone comes out first, then the goat, right hand always goes in first. If the right hand picks out the black stone, then the goat on his right hand will live. It will be taken into the wilderness. It will be the scapegoat. And so the ritual is the same. Some years it would be the goat on the right hand that got to live. The black stone comes out first. Some years it will be the goat on the left hand. And then there was another ritual that uh, the Bible doesn't address, but all of the Jewish histories address. And and this is an amazing thing. It is the original red scarf campaign. Uh, They tell us that when the goat was chosen, and they knew which goat now was the Lord's goat and which was the scapegoat, they would cut up a piece of red wool and they would make uh, ropes or scarves or threads, whatever the wording would be, but it was basically a piece of wool. And they would take three pieces of wool. Um, Brother Rob and Brother Alan, would you just come up here to the front? 
Your wives have called you old goats before, so tonight we're going to let you be old goats, okay? Notice that I did not pick on Noel Phillips, even though I'm sure somebody's called him an old goat sometime in his life. Now, now let's, let's assume that the goat on the right, let's assume that for this particular year, the goat on the right, it's the white stone that comes out first. And when the white stone comes out first, that is the Lord's goat. It says right on the stone, for the Lord. And so the priest would take a red piece of wool and tie it around the goat's throat. You don't have to do it real tight. You know, we want you to live through this. And so on this particular year, we'll pretend that the black stone, which says for Azazel, for the scapegoat, that that stone comes out second. And so it's the goat on the left that is chosen to be the scapegoat. Now the scapegoat lives, but the scapegoat bears the sins of the people. And so the scapegoat, the priest would take a red cloth and tie it around the goat's horns, its head. This should be really interesting. Now, Rob, if you'd have tied that the other way, you would have looked kind of gangsterish, but that's okay. It's good. And so if you turn around and just face the congregation, I won't torment you or keep you up here for very long. You guys just turn around and face the congregation. And so the two goats. For the Lord... The goat had a red scarf, if you will, tied around its neck because it's going to die. Its throat will be cut and it will give its life's blood. It's the Lord's goat. And then the scapegoat, the, the red cord, is tied around its horns because that represents that the sins of the people are going to rest on the head of that goat, and it will be taken from the camp. And then history tells us, Jewish history tells us, that there would be another uh, red cord, another red scarf, another piece of red wool, and it would be tied around the door or the post of the tabernacle, later around the door of the temple. And it would literally be tied there, and all of Israel, the tens of thousands of people on the temple mount, could see the third red scarf, tied around the door of the temple. Guys, just keep those, if you would, with you, but if you'd go be seated, you're fine. Thank you. Now, some years it was the goat on the right hand that got to live. Some years the goat on the left hand. It was always unique. It was always a moment of tension. It was always a moment of great ceremony. And what a picture it was. You see, Jesus... He was both. He was the Lord's goat who shed his blood for us. But Jesus was so magnificent and so powerful that he was also the scapegoat. He was also the, ones that, the one that bore our sins and removed them from us because the scapegoat would be led outside the camp. Do you realize that in your gospel, the Bible is full of so much symbolism and these stories just get more and more beautiful? We read in John 19 and 2 that the soldiers, they plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head and they put on him a purple robe. What do you think a crown of thorns does to the human head? It circles that head with red blood. Jesus was the Lord's goat. He gave his life, but he was also the scapegoat. He had a red band around his head. Because he was marked to take our sins. After the Lord's goat was slaughtered and its blood was sprinkled, the high priest would then go over to the scapegoat and with that red cord tied around its head, he would lay his hands on the head of the scapegoat. Because the high priest had to lay his hands, the priesthood, they had to lay their hands on that scapegoat and the high priest would confess the sins of the entire nation for an entire year and plead for the people. He would speak that long list of sins that had been told to the priests who had offered sacrifice after sacrifice for the sins of individuals. And everybody listening would be reminded again and again and again of their guilt and of their need for atonement. 
Look at this, Leviticus 16, 21. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions in all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat. And then he shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited. And then that man will let the goat go, not in the city, not in the countryside around Jerusalem, but he will make sure that that goat is let go in the wilderness where it cannot ever find its way back to Jerusalem. The scapegoat was an important part of this great day of atonement. Can you imagine the humiliation and embarrassment as the entire nation listens to the high priest read a list of sins and confess them over the head of that goat? Even in doing it in generalities, which I can't imagine that they would do it any other way. But as the high priest confessed the sins and the lusts and the adulteries and the, the stealing and the cheating and the hatred and the violence of God's people. It was an embarrassing moment. Do you realize that nothing's in your Bible by accident? When Jesus stood before the Sanhedrin and the priests beat him around the head and slapped his face, do you know what they were doing? They didn't realize what they were doing. They were laying their hands on the head of the scapegoat. They didn't even realize it. Jesus was both the Lord's goat and the scapegoat. The scapegoat would be taken several miles out into the wilderness. It would be released. And Jewish history records that at the moment, it was a supernatural thing. At the moment the scapegoat was released in the wilderness, they didn't have to guess because they could see it. That piece of red wool, red is the color of blood, it's also the color of redemption. And at the moment that goat was released in the wilderness, the Jewish uh, historians tell us that that red piece of wool, that red scarf tied on the door of the temple would turn pure white, symbolizing that God had forgiven the nation. That's why Isaiah picks up on the imagery in Isaiah 118. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. My goodness, I know it's Bible study and I know it's a lesson, but is there anybody here that's grateful for the great forgiveness God has given us? We don't deserve this, folks. We, we don't deserve this. So you imagine the scene. The high priest and tens of thousands of people, they're watching as the goat is taken away. One goat has been sacrificed. The other goat has been taken away. And they watch and they watch until that man leads that goat out of sight on the horizon. Imagine their excitement to know that the further that goat walked, the further their sins got from them. They were literally being taken away. That's why Leviticus uses the word Azazel for the scapegoat. It means the goat of departure. It's the goat of taking away sin. John 19, verse 15. They cried out, Away with Jesus. Away with Him. Crucify Him. And Pilate said, Shall I crucify your king? And it's the priests who are answering. It's the priests who are conducting this ritual that they don't even know they're conducting. They said, We have no king but Caesar. And then delivered Pilate Jesus to them to be crucified. Watch. And they took Jesus and led Him him away. He's Azazel. He's the goat of departure. He's the one that takes our sin away. And the further that goat walked from Jerusalem, the further that goat got from the door of the temple, the happier Israel got. I got to tell somebody here tonight that you may not be perfect and you may fall and fail and falter and you may be fragile and fickle sometimes, but please hear me. Turn around sometime and look at how far you've come in God. Yes, you've got a long way to go, but you're not who you used to be. You're not what you used to be. And your sins are getting further away from you every day you walk with Jesus. 
in the centuries that followed the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70, the Jewish people began to write two versions of their history, along with many religious commentaries. The two versions of their history, one was written in what we call Palestine, and it became known as the Jerusalem Talmud. The other was written in Babylon, where some of the captives had gone and then stayed. And there were Jews still in Babylon, and so as they practiced their religion and as they recorded their history and they wrote it down, that became known as the Babylonian Talmud. And they both still exist today. They can be looked up and referenced by the Jews. So there's the Jerusalem Talmud, a a record of the Jewish history and, and their religious commentary. And there's the Babylonian Talmud. They sometimes cover different things. But when they agree, you can mark it down. That, that's pretty close to fact. That's as close to fact as any history textbook you could ever read. Because one's being recorded in Jerusalem. One's being recorded hundreds and hundreds of miles away in Babylon. Here's what the Jerusalem Talmud says. Forty years before the destruction of the temple, the western light went out, the crimson thread remained crimson, the lot for the Lord always came up in the left hand. They would close the gates of the temple by night and get up in the morning and find them wide open. That's the Jerusalem Talmud. The Babylonian Talmud, writing about the same period, says this. During the last 40 years before the destruction of the temple, the lot for the Lord did not come up in the right hand, nor did the crimson-colored strap become white. Nor did the westernmost light shine, and the doors of the temple would open by themselves. Since both Talmuds record the same information, the knowledge of those events was obviously accepted as fact by the widespread Jewish community. Now, this is Bible study tonight. What's the significance of what the Jews write about their history in the 40 years before the destruction of the temple in AD 70? You see, always before, on the great day of atonement, when the high priest reached into that urn and took up a lot, it would come up randomly. Some years, the white stone would come up first for the Lord. Some years, the black stone would come up first, Azazel, for the scapegoat. But for 40 years leading up to the destruction of the temple, every time in those 40 years... Forty different days of atonement, the high priest would reach his hand into the urn and every single time for 40 years, he would reach in and up would come the black stone first. The odds of that happening are one in 5.5 billion and it caused incredible consternation among the Jews. Always before, the red wool that was tied to the temple door had turned white miraculously the moment the scapegoat was set free in the wilderness. But for 40 years leading up to the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70, that wool tied on the temple door every year when they did that same ceremony. For 40 years, the wool remained crimson. And it concerned every citizen of Israel because they were puzzled, they were scared, they were frightened. It indicated something had gone wrong with the ritual and for some reason their sins were not being carried away. Always before, the high priest had replenished the oil in the golden candlestick in the temple every morning and then every evening and that light was never allowed to go out. But for 40 years before the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70, The Jews record in the Babylonian Talmud and in the Jerusalem Talmud. They record that the lamp, the golden candlestick, every night, although it had been filled with oil in the morning and burned all day, and although it was filled full of oil in the evening, every night for 40 years, it went out of its own accord sometime through the night, no matter what precautions the priest took. That's over 12,500 nights in a row. Always before, the doors to the temple, those big beautiful doors had remained shut at night. 
And that limited the access to the holy places of worship. But the Jews record it in two Talmuds, two different groups of Jewish people. It's as accurate and rock solid as anything we can get from Jewish history. That for 40 years before the destruction of the temple, those huge gates, no matter what they did, no matter how they blocked them, those huge gates would swing open every night of their own accord for 40 years leading up to the destruction of the temple. Which begs a question. What in the world happened 40 years before the destruction of the temple that caused such a dramatic and unusual thing to occur in Israel? Just one thing. That in the month of Nisan, in the year A.D. 30 or thereabouts, Jesus Christ... Israel's Messiah, who was the Lord's goat and the real scapegoat, He sacrificed His life for our sins, and He carried our sins far away from us. Meaning that no sacrifice was necessary or accepted in heaven the next day or the next week or the next month or the next year because Jesus had paid it all. And that's why God visibly demonstrated to His earthly people, the Jews, that the Old Testament system was no longer working. For years, the Jews thought it had something to do with a warning of judgment that for 40 years, God was warning them of the judgment to come in A.D. 70. That's not it. It was what happened in A.D. 30 that changed everything. And up till the day that the temple was destroyed, up till the day that the temple was burned to the ground for all of those days over 40 years the Old Testament sacrificial system the original red scarf campaign it didn't work anymore the scarf it stayed red it didn't turn white the stone always came up first black. It always came up in a way that scared the Jews. For 40 years, every night, the candlestick would go out and every night, those doors would open. You know what's going on in there? It's God showing them, hey, this Old Testament system, it's done. Something better has come. We we always talk as Christians about the day that Jesus cried, it is finished. And the inner veil between the holy place and the holy of holies, it was rent and it allowed a way to God. But there was another door that kept the people out. It was the outside doors that led into the holy place. Well, you know what? Every night for 40 years until that temple was no more, it wasn't just that the veil had been rent, but God kept kicking the doors open every night showing everybody, anybody can walk into my presence. Anybody can be covered by my blood. Anybody can have their sins taken far from them because I am the fulfillment of everything that the Old Testament was pointing to. It's amazing. And the writer of Hebrews, he alludes to some of this stuff. Chapter 9, verse 11. But Christ being come, and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle. We don't need this temple anymore. Because this new tabernacle is not made with hands. That is to say, it's not of this building. Neither by the blood of goats and calves. But by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place. You ever noticed that and wondered about it? Because it's always about the lamb, the lamb, the lamb. But Hebrews is very careful to say the blood of goats and calves. That's an allusion to the scapegoat and the Lord's goat. It wasn't by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered in once into the holy place and he obtained eternal redemption for us. It only took once. And that one was so powerful and so eternal and so awesome and so far reaching it literally shut down the Jewish sacrificial system for the next 40 years for if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean if that could sanctify to the purifying of the flesh how much more if that could push sins ahead all the years of the Old Testament how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God how much more can Jesus blood purge your conscience from dead works and set you free to serve the living God if 
Old Testament lamb's blood could send your sins ahead one year at a time. Jesus' blood is so powerful and eternal, it can erase your sins for all of time and all of eternity. That's the New Testament plan of salvation. <laughs> Hebrews 9 again, verse 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, they were just the figures. They were just the pattern. They were just the storybook. They were just the picture of the true. But instead, He entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that He should offer Himself often. Everybody say, not often. As the high priest entered, uh, entered into the holy place every year with the blood of others. See, the high priest had to take in other blood. The blood of a sacrificial animal. But Jesus didn't have to do that. He took in his own blood. For then must he often, everyone say, not often. If that was true, he would have had to often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But Jesus doesn't have to suffer often. Jesus has, doesn't have to go in often. Jesus doesn't have to go and make another sacrifice often. Verse 26, um, but now once... Everybody say once. In the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So here's the deal. In the Old Testament, it's often. In the New Testament, it's not often. In fact, it's once. Old Testament, it's every year. Old Testament, it's every time the Day of Atonement rolls around. Old Testament, it's the same two goats being chosen and one is killed and one's led away and it happens over and over and over again. But when Jesus died, He doesn't have to do it often. He doesn't even have to do it twice. He did it once and that one sacrifice was so powerful, we're still feeling the reverberations in every single life that's in every single seat in this room. My goodness. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. And we preach that at funerals, that we're appointed once to die. But don't miss the bigger point here. And as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. <laughs> oh my goodness. So Christ was once offered, everybody say once, to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Wait a second. Without sin unto salvation. Jesus had no sin the first time he came. He took our sin, but he had no sin. So, who appears the second time without sin unto salvation? Well, obviously Jesus. But we do. <laughs> we do. Um, don't miss his bigger point. I know we preach that scripture at funerals and we should. Yes, you're going to die once. But that's not the bigger point. It is appointed unto man once to die. And when you die, there will be a judgment. But Jesus interfered with that. He was once offered to bear the sins of many. So you've got to get this. That you're appointed to die once, and after you die, there will be a judgment. This is what we preach. This is what we've experienced. Do you know what Jesus did for us? He flipped it. We're supposed to die once and then go to judgment. He took judgment and put it before our death. In fact, He put it before our birth. In fact, He put it 2,000 years ago. And He took our judgment on the cross 2,000 years ago. And you can't be judged twice for your sins. So when you die, if you're in Him, your judgment's already done. So we're only appointed unto death once and unto judgment once. So, so here's the deal. If your judgment has already been taken by Jesus, death is not scary anymore. Death is not terrifying anymore. Death is a doorway to an eternity with the one that paid the price for your sin. And when we see him, he'll be without sin. And oh my goodness, for the first time, we will be without sin. Right now, I know your spirit's redeemed, and I know your soul, your mind, you're fighting the good fight. But I know your flesh and mine is totally unredeemed. 
But when we see him, we're going to be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So you talk about an incredible day. The excitement of heaven. Yes, it's going to be seeing our loved ones that have gone on before. Yes, it's going to be seeing all the beauty of heaven. But the real excitement of heaven is seeing the one who took our judgment. He's the only reason we can be here. And and, and then just, just realizing all of a sudden, I don't know when it will hit us, but it's going to hit us. The realization that I'm without sin sin just like Jesus was without sin. I, I'm not a sinner saved by grace anymore. I am a new translated being. I'm just like Jesus. Oh my goodness. Jesus was both the Lord's goat, the sacrifice that paid for our sins, and he was the scapegoat, the one who carried our sins away. And of course the great thing about the scapegoat was that it was let go in the wilderness And they didn't kill it. That's so important. Because when it was let go in the wilderness, it kept on moving. And the picture is that my confessed sins, my sins that are under the blood, my sins get further and further from me. Every minute I live for God. Not Even the devil can catch up with forgiven sins. He can threaten. He can bluster. He can brag. He can boast. He can try to bring it up. But listen to me. If it's under the blood, it's under the blood. Heaven has forgotten it and you should too. Heaven has dealt with it and you don't need to. Heaven has forgiven it so you don't have to. Your sins are under the blood and he took them away. He carried them away. And so they're getting further and further from you every moment you live for God. Ryan, come on back and play. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. This is amazing. Only Jesus could pull it off. He died for me, but he lives for me. (laughs) He died to take my sins. He lives to carry my sins away from me. 1 John 1 and 7, last scripture. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Our Bible lovers, you've heard us teach King James Version is an old version of Scripture. It's over 400 years old. But it's like Shakespeare. It's timeless. It has such beauty and power. And Some of the new versions do pretty good and some of them miss a few things. But you can't really get this word unless you tag ETH on the end of it. Because it's not just that Jesus' blood cleansed me. It's that it cleanseth me. It repeats the process continually. But wait, I I thought Jesus only died once. He did. That's what's so incredible. His sacrifice was so powerful, it's still reverberating today. It's still active today. I fear sometimes that we become paranoid almost. I believe that Christians should live a lifestyle of godliness and righteousness and holiness. We believe that and we teach that and we expect that. And we're right to do so because the Word teaches it. But can I just tell you Pentecostal people that I love so much, I'm so honored to be called your pastor, don't ever think it's you. Don't ever think it's you meriting what you have or who you are. Don't ever think it's you holding yourself up by your own bootstraps. Don't ever think it's you doing all the good things that you do. Don't ever think it's you living the holy life that you live. Don't ever think it's you. Christ in you. That's the hope of glory. If it had not been for the blood, if it had not been for the only one, die for my sins and live to take them away at the same time I wouldn't even be here and you wouldn't either oh we might be religious we might even talk about 
some of the same things, but we wouldn't be here like we are tonight. I know it's Bible study. I know it's a little Bible lesson. My goodness, I feel the presence of the Lord. Alan and Rob, would you just come up one more time and bring those scarves with you? You don't have to tie them on. You can just hold them up in your hand if you would for me, guys. So over here is the Lord's coat. Offered for sin on Calvary. If Jesus hadn't died that agonizing death, we have no price for our redemption. We're still in our sins. But Jesus isn't just that. He's also this. Rob, I just want you to walk down that center aisle and across the back and just keep on walking. Just don't stop. Hold that scarf up, would you? See, there's the other thing Jesus did for us. He took our sin and he took them away from us. But he ever liveth to make intercession for us, meaning that his power is still active in our lives today. That's why walking with the Lord is so important. Because as I walk with him, he continues his work. He never stops. Now, Rob's walking around the sanctuary, but that's not what Jesus does. He doesn't walk in a circle. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far he removes our transgressions from us. So if you could imagine in a straight line going forever, Jesus has been carrying our sins away from us for 2,000 years. That's why it's important to walk with the Lord. That's why it's important to be consistent. That's why it's important to let Jesus forgive you and keep your list short with the Lord and every day ask for God's forgiveness because you got to keep your sin under the blood. you got to keep that blood active in your life. you got to let Jesus keep doing His work. So don't shut Him out and don't shut Him down and don't walk away and don't rebel against it and don't get an attitude. We need every day the cleansing cleansing of the blood of Jesus Christ. I don't care if you've been serving the Lord for 75 years. Every day we need the cleansing of the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful he died. I'm so thankful for Calvary. But I'll tell you what else I'm thankful for. I am thankful that he ever liveth to make intercession for me. That means one prayer and I can get in touch with the God who can forgive every sin and heal every disease and cleanse every iniquity. I wish you'd stand with me. I wish you'd lift your hands right now and I wish you'd open your mouth this time and I wish you would give God a great praise at the end of this Bible study. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood. Thank you for your cleansing. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you, God, for your plan. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood that heals all of our diseases and forgives all of our iniquities. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Thank you, Alan, and thank you, Rob. I'm so glad you were in Bible study tonight. Uh, and, and we're going to close. Brother Adam Hundley, I just saw you. Would you run up here? I want you to pray or greet us or do something in the end. I really don't care what you do. We just love missionaries. Could you take the hand of the person next to you and could you lift it high with your hand right now and let's just pray. You don't know who in here might have been struggling this week. You don't know who in here might have fallen down this week. You don't know who in here might need God's forgiveness. Got good news for you, church. The blood that we've been singing about and preaching about and trusting in. That blood still works tonight. You can be forgiven. You can be restored. You can be delivered. You can be healed. I don't care who you are or what you've done. That blood still works. That blood still works. And because the blood is still flowing and the blood is still moving, because of that, you can be set free right now, and you can be healed right now, and you can be delivered right now. Yes, 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 yes. I love you.
love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus.